Hey, let's pray once again. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. Spirit of the Most High God, you are what brings the law and love and grace and mercy and these boundaries that God places in us. You are the one that brings them into balance. Lord, we pray this morning for those that are here. And God, I don't know everyone's story. I don't know uh, their journey. I don't know how they feel towards faith and church and God. We, those things are unknown to me, but they are known to you. And we pray, Holy Spirit, this morning as we teach, as we look at the first commandment, that we would realize, God, that it goes deeper than just simply what the words meant, but it's, it's something more profound that we have forgotten in a very distracted culture. Lord, we pray this morning for our time together in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to continue on a series that we started off last week called The Ten. And the idea behind this series is to look at, to understand the Ten Commandments. Now, we want to recap what we talked about last week to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page, because last week was our introduction. So last week, we, last week we talked about this idea about the law. And what we said was, is no one likes it. No one wants to talk about it. No one wants to think about it, right? Isaac Khalil said this, the subject of, of, of God's law is controversial among churches that call themselves Christian. In the professing Christian world, there is much confusion and division about God's law. Some churches reject the law wholesale, while others reject portions of it. And we talked about that, right? This is a bit of a problem. So the question we have and the question that's on social media and in and, and the world is, you know, the Old Testament is very, it's barbaric, right? It's bloodthirsty, it's barbaric, it's weird, it has different cultures, it has different names, and so you look at it, you read through it, and you're like, okay, what am I supposed to take from this, and what am I not supposed to take from this? And, and the question he says there, like, sometimes we take all the law, or we, sometimes we take parts of it, and when we take parts of it, what parts do we like? And oftentimes what the law really looks like is a reflection of what we like and what we don't like. I like this, therefore God must like that, and I don't like this, therefore God must not like that. And so it's really kind of, um, I, I don't want to say it's half-hearted, but it's, not a, it's, it's more of a dishonest approach to the unity of Scripture. Uh, we looked at uh, Kevin DeYoung and says this, the commandments not only show us what God wants, but they show us what God is like. And this is actually kind of important. So the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the foundation of our relationship, and I love what the video said there, that this, this kind of spiritual constitution, it actually tells us uh, something about who the person is. So if you create rules, so when I was growing up, uh, whenever, uh, so I grew up in, um, when we first immigrated from India, uh, we, we, we lived in this kind of a, a housing complex where a lot of immigrants live. And so what we used to happen is you used to play hide-and-go-seek because there's all these buildings, these townhouses, and we used to play hide-and-go-seek a lot. But what would have to happen at the very beginning of each game is we had to go over the rules, right? Because you had to make sure that everybody was on the same page about the rules because everyone comes with hide-and-go-seek rules of, 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 of varying of nature, right? So, you know, one rule was, like, you know, you, we, if, you're, if the person trying to catch everybody, you had to leave the, pl the place that was safe or else you can't just sit there and kind of haunt it. Okay, and so the rules were important to the game because unless you understood the rules and unless everyone played by the same rules, it just didn't work. Well, the thing that's interesting about these rules is that um, they kind of help us to na navigate what is meant or what is required of us. Well, the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments reflect a little bit, or not a little bit, a lot about who God is. And while we wrestle with it, we try to figure out, okay, what's for us, what's not for us? How do we actually have to go through it? What we really need to ask ourselves is what is God trying to actually do with these rules, with these laws? And so we, we kind of looked a little bit about that. Um, we looked at this aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, of the introduction to the law, right? So Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, and we looked at the prologue to the law, right? So the law was given, but there's a lot that's happened before that, right? We have the 10 plagues in Egypt. And one of these days, I'm going to teach a sermon on the 10 plagues, but the 10 plagues were so fascinating because each plague was in direct correlation to an Egyptian deity, so when God said that they're going to do this, the Egyptians said, well, no, we have a God that will protect us. And God, by overcoming, by sending these plagues, was showing that his authority and power was greater than this Egyptian deity. So it, all this took place in Egypt, and finally the Pharaoh relents and lets the people go. And of course, the Red Sea, you know, all that kind of stuff happens. But then you get to the Mount Sinai where God gives a law. And what God says to them is he reminds them of what has happened. Now, the reason that's important is because... If you're going to hear the rules, if you're going to hear about what a person wants from you, you want to know that they actually are invested in the relationship. 
kind of makes sense a little bit, right? So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 says this, exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the reason the writer, and remember, we talk about this at UCC, is that the Bible gives us hints and details for us to understand the context of the story. The reason the writer says two months afterwards, because what they're showing is that, you know, two months may seem like a lifetime for us, but it's really, it's an immediate thing. It's very recent, right? It's one thing to say, you know, 10 years later, God comes along and gives them the law, right? Or even a year later. So the writer, by telling us it's two months, is saying that when the Israelites arrived to Sinai, to this mountain there where God is going to give the law, it is in their memory is all that has happened to them. It's in the very recent memory so that it's not as if God's like, hey, remember when? And people are like, I don't remember that, right? So God's like, okay, this happened. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we remember because we were there. We looked at Deuteronomy chapter 30. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, remember, and, and in the video there um, from the Bible Project, which, by the way, is a great little uh, YouTube channel to kind of help us to kind of walk through some of these complicated issues. In, in Deuteronomy, remember I said to you last week, Deuteronomy is the last book of uh, uh, before the people get into the promised land, right? So you have the, the book of Deuteronomy. So you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Torah, the Tanakh. It's the foundation by which the Old Testament will be built upon. Well, oh, close to the very end of this, and, and the book of Deuteronomy is Moses's very long sermon. And I said to you last week, and no one laughed, which I felt kind of offended by, that you think I preach a long time. Imagine sitting there for 30, 35 chapters, 30 plus chapters of Moses' sermon there. And in the, towards the end of the chapter, he says this. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Now, what was important about this passage of scripture is when we think about the law, when we think about how God get, has a law for us, a lot of times we can think of it as a rule that we don't like or we don't understand. But Moses doesn't say that. Moses prefaces the law with saying, Ultimately, whatever happens between whatever you choose to do now and the future, the foundation of the law is meant to be love, right? First, love God. First, understand that God's love is the foundation of the law. Because if you understand that, if you understand that the person who loves you is trying to help you, trying to care for you, then all of a sudden, the law doesn't feel onerous, doesn't feel burdensome, but it feels like a relational understanding. And as I said to you before, every relationship has rules, Right? And as I mentioned before, as a pastor, I've done many, many weddings. Many weddings, especially because I was a youth and young adults pastor for a long time. And whenever, you know, the couples will do their vows or, or in the ceremony, what is supposed to happen, and, and you may not realize this, but in a marriage ceremony, what is actually taking place is the rules for this relationship are being set forward. Right? Vows are meant to say, this is what I promise to you, right? And, and, and you, this is how I plan to live my life with you. And However that plays out, that's a whole different conversation, right? But the intent is on this day is like, this is what I want for the future. You're like, okay. But what you're really saying is these are the rules by which our relationship is going to go forward. So the first one we say is that I will be faithful to you. You're like, yeah, that actually seems like a good a relational rule. So people who, call, who kind of, uh, we talked a little bit about that uh, last week about orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, right? Orthodoxy is right belief, orthopraxy is right behavior. And people tend to say, well, I want to behave this way or I want to believe this way. It's like, no, 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 you can't separate the two. They're together. Orthodoxy, orthopraxy, religion and relationship, however you want to view it, these are meant to be intertwined. And Moses lays, lays this out for us in Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is why whenever I hear people kind of have this conversation about, oh, I'm not into religion, I'm into relationship. I'm like, no, you're not. Because every relationship has rules. Whether you like it or not, whether, you, whether it implied or, 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 or not even implied, but actually, you know, uh, but put forward there, every relationship has rules. And so that's how relationships work. That's how they stay healthy because everyone understands the boundaries by which this relationship is meant to grow. We wrapped up by looking at uh, Romans chapter 7 a little bit where this is Paul's fantastic statement where he says, you know, I don't know what, what is right and what is wrong without the law. And this is partly why we hate the law, because we don't want to be told what is right and what is wrong. We prefer to live our lives as we want to live them, right? We, want to, we just want to do whatever we want. We want, to, we want to live however we want, and we just believe that God's okay with whatever that looks like. And the unfortunate thing is God is not. He actually believes that the, that the relationship he has with us, and he is invested. And we're going to look at that this morning a little bit. 
one of the things we have to realize is that how, whatever you view about God, however you understand God, and I realize in a room like this, people have different backgrounds, different experiences, and even your experiences with church can really hurt or help your relationship with God. I get that. But as we talk about an uptown community church, let's go back to the Bible. Before we make the Bible say something different, let's at least accept what it says on face value and then go from there. Right? And what the thing that the Bible says is that the law is actually important because it helps us to understand what is right and what is wrong. And unfortunately, especially in our culture today, what is right and what is wrong is now very negotiable. And, and, and I think the church has made a mistake of making too many rules. Like, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I grew up in a very holiness background church. So I grew up Pentecostal. And for all of you recovering Pentecostals, like, amen, or you can speak in tongues, whatever you want to do, that's fine. But, like, as Pentecostals, we were told, I was told, that in order to go to church, you had to wear a suit. When I went to seminary, when I went to Bible college, I wore suits to class because that's what we were told you're supposed to do. And I, can you imagine wearing a full suit, jacket, tie, pants, and you had to have a haircut, and you had to be clean shaven unless you had a beard, and then you had to have the beard before you got to school. That's all this thing. And it's like, okay, this is what a, a servant of the Lord, this is what a pastor is supposed to be, and this is what they're supposed to look like, and these are the rules. And, of course, you're like, oh, that, that would, like we, were in, we were in school desks in suits writing notes because this is time. This is I mean, when dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? There's no computers at that time, right? And so we, 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 that's what we did, but that's what was required of us, so that's what we did. Right or wrong, that's what it was, right? But that was the rules of Bible college. And you can look back at that and it's like, oh, well, that seems kind of backwards, maybe, but that was just what, that's what we were told to do. And so we did it, not because I thought it was great. Like, one of the things they told us, we, were not, we weren't allowed to go to the movies, I love going to the movies, and the VCR was just starting to kick off there, and so, you know, you couldn't really rent a whole lot of stuff back then, and the stuff you could rent was just, we rented this movie called Posse, and never rent a movie called Posse, it was terrible. Uh, anyway, so the point was, these are the rules, we just did them, and that was the way it goes. But the thing was, is that at the end of the day, I think if we were honest, we would say that our denomination, our Bible college, they really want what's best for us, so they're trying to help us understand what it's like to be a pastor which I don't think they were actually prepared us to be, but this is what they said. So, okay. And A.W. Tozer, I think, actually kind of encapsulates this really well when he says this. To escape the error of salvation by works, we have fallen into the opposite error of salvation without obedience. In our eagerness to get rid of the legalistic doctrine of works, we have thrown out the baby with the bath and gotten rid of obedience as well. And this one hurts a little bit if you think about it. Because we have now created a kind of a Western Christianity, where we are about entertainment, about how hip we are. Look at all my tattoos. Look at like this, this, and like I got these piercings, and we got all these lights and and smoke machines and haze machines, and we got a clown coming out, and the pastor's going to ride in on a camel, and like we, this is what Western Christianity has become, and it's almost to the point of like, wait, you know what? Um, just at least do what the Bible says. How about we just start off with that part there? And that's why we kind of talk about Uptown. And in your update, it says, like, you know, welcome to Uptown Community Church. We're not here to entertain you. You're not here to perform. And this is a this is a intentional statement that we've made that we don't want to recreate this kind of Western entertainment idea of church. We want to say, you know what? Whatever the church is, it's meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit, meant to be a whole bunch of different people from different backgrounds, wrestling with faith, and hopefully we can figure it out together. And whether we've succeeded or not, that's a whole different conversation, but that's our attempt. So whenever we look at the law, we have to say to ourselves that it's there for a reason. And before we dismiss it, before we get rid of it, before we say it doesn't apply to me, we have to first understand what it's trying to say to us. And each of the Ten Commandments, each of the Decalogue, is actually going to highlight something for us that is meant to be protective, and it's also meant to be uh, um, actually something that helps us for it. Okay, good. So let's go on here, and we're going to jump into the first one. The first one we're going to get to, we're going to look at a, a guy by the name of Earl Nightingale. And by the way, Nightingale, great last name. Uh, there's an article written in 1957. It was called The Strange Secret. And what Earl Nightingale said back in 1957, which other people have said historically, is something kind of interesting. This is what uh, some excerpts from the article. He said this, We become what we think about most of the time, and that's the strangest secret. Now, why do I say it's strange, and why do I call it a secret? Actually, it isn't a secret at all. It was first promulgated by some of the earliest wise men and appears again and again throughout the Bible. But very few people have learned it or understand it. That's why it's strange, and why for some equally strange reason, it virtually remains a secret. 
So what Earl Nightingale said in 1957 was that whatever you are, whatever you will become, it's what you dwell on, what you think about. In other words, what do you focus on? He believes, and, and, and rightfully so, he said, you know what? We as a culture have forgotten that whatever preoccupies us is what we will move towards unintentionally. Now, if you can, if, for those of you who drive in this room, do you remember when you first started driving? If you remember the driver training classes, one of the things they taught you was is that you will, you will automatically drive towards what you stare at. So if you turn your head, and right? So the maturity of driving was to be able to turn your head by not turning the wheel. Right? That's how you kind of knew about driving, right? So what he was saying is that that's kind of what human beings are like, that what we focus on is where we will naturally tend to go towards. And the thing he said was interesting. He goes, it seems like a strange secret, but it's not really a secret at all because historically people have been talking about this for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, when you look at people who talk about behavioral psychology, behavioral modification, my undergrad, so my degree was in theology, but my undergrad was in psychology. And so part of the psychology is developmental psychology, behavioral psychology. Like, what is it that helps people change or become or, or transform? And this is a great conversation. People are talking about this a lot. Well, one of the things he says is that it's not as complicated as we think sometimes. Whatever we think about a lot whatever we obsess over, whatever we are, are looking at, we will actually move in that direction. Every one of us is the sum total of our own thoughts. And that's actually kind of a, an interesting statement. And we see this again. Marcus Aurelius, I, I don't want to say he's the father of Stoicism, but uh, you know, the, the Roman emperor who was like a uh, kind of a philosopher emperor, he wrote a lot of um, uh, sayings in uh, a book of Stoicism, which is kind of a, a Greek way of philosophy, which is very influential to the early church movement. So in Marcus Aurelius, he says this, a man's life is what his thoughts make of it. And of course, he's writing the context. So let's just say a person's life. Let's be uh, gender inclusive there, right? So uh, a person's life is what their thoughts make of it. So what's interesting, he says, is whatever you think about is what you will become. Right, we see this again by Brian Tracy. He says it this way. The law of concentration states that whatever you dwell upon grows. The more you think about something, the more it becomes part of your reality. Now, have you ever had a conversation with someone you've just met, and within the first five minutes, do you know what they really love? Right? So if you ever met somebody who's into veganism, Right? They, are, they are passionate about not eating certain types of food. And that's cool. Like, I'm, not, I'm not making any statements in regards to you know, whatever you want to eat. That's, that's cool, right? Or if you met someone who likes cars or someone who likes sports or somebody who's really into the Toronto Raptors right now or, or somebody like, like people, people, we will talk about what we're really interested in. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to, please answer these 10 questions, right? It's like, as soon as you're talking to them, the interest that they have just emerge to the surface. Because why? We are what we talk about. We are what we think about. And so the first commandment we are going to look at, can it almost come down to this one statement I, I, I've written here? It says this, we think too little about what we think about. Sometimes we have to stop and ask ourselves, what are we thinking about during the day? What are we reading? What are we looking on social media? What are we looking on the internet? What are we obsessed about? What is it that we are always interested in? Because as soon as we identify that, we all of a sudden identify what really kind of, what the true course or trajectory of our lives is. So sometimes you'll talk to people and uh, they'll be like, oh, I'm really passionate about uh, helping people. So the next question you ask them is, well, what does that actually look like? How are you helping people? And it's like, well, you know, I, I, I shared this article on Facebook. Or I, I tweeted this. I was like, oh, okay. So you just like talking about this, but actually not doing it, right? So you see this, you see a disconnect between what they say and what they do, right? Orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, right? And so what we say here is that, okay, however we understand, whatever we think about, we will truly understand what we do. So the interesting thing is your behavior will always identify your beliefs, right? Your behavior will always identify your beliefs. And I've used this analogy before, but uh, for a number of years, I worked with um, uh, um, addicts, uh, working with the 12-step programs and things like that. And again, when you talk to an addict, their addiction is all they think about, right? Whether, again, that next hit, whether um, experiencing this thing or doing, like, they're, they are focused on this one thing that is going to give them a great deal of pleasure or of meaning, 
right? One of the things that uh, when you get into uh, working with addicts, the, the, the statement that always rings true is an addict is a person that's chasing their first high. The first time they've experienced something, done something, they are going to try to, try to get that high back and they'll increase, they'll do whatever to get that, right? So an addict is always about this thing. And whatever it is, whatever it, this experience, whether this substance, whatever it would be, their entire lives is focused on obtaining this thing, right? Well, believe it or not, we are addicts in our own right, and, and we could be quite literally substances or, or, or internet or other things, but we, 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 we become what we repetitively do. But what we repetitively do is what we also think about, what we think about a lot, actually. And so the first commandment is going to actually address this. And one of the things that's going to be interesting as we walk through these commandments, as we walk through how the Bible views this, what we're going to realize is each of these commandments is partly, you know, um, for those of you like King James or Shakespeare, thou shalt not, right? So whenever God says thou shalt not, the opposite part of it is also true, thou shalt, right? So every time a, a commandment is given, there might be a negative aspect of it, don't do this, but the implication is then do this. And so in the video there, you saw there are 613 rules that the Jewish people had, but each of these 613 rules are expansions of the Ten Commandments. It's like, okay, you didn't get this right, and next week we're going to look at the next one, and you'll see how this plays out like literally the same day of. Right, but so God says, "Okay, thou shalt not." Okay, you didn't get that right. So here are here's thirty other ways of understanding this one rule. Right, it's like, oh, okay. So the six hundred thirteen are really pulled out of the ten that are, are the original ones. So um, when we look at uh, the the nine commandments, the first one is actually unique from the other nine. Nine commandments proscribe or prescribe certain actions that, for God's people. The first commandment, however, is unique in that it regulates a certain relationship between God and his people. Now, this is important because God is going to give the first commandment. And, and again, Moses is up on this mountain and he's waiting for it. Whatever it is going to be, give it to me, right? And again, the first one, the first thing that God says is not about behavior. It's not about orthopraxy. It's actually about orthodoxy. It's about right belief. And what is the right belief that God wants his people to understand? Well, if you have your Bibles, you can go to Exodus chapter 20, but you will only be there briefly because we're going to have to kind of bounce around a little bit to kind of understand this. So the first commandment is this. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 to 3 says this. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. So this is the first commandment. Now, before we kind of unpack this a little bit, um, for those of you who might read ahead, spoiler alert, you're going to come across a concept about God that can be very disturbing. And that concept is of God being a jealous God. What is interesting about jealousy is that we see jealousy as something that is negative. And I think rightfully so. So if you've ever um, dated somebody and uh, they were a person that was quite jealous, in that jealousy is really insecurity right? Insecurity is what are going to make them act or behave in certain ways, which are going to be very uh, toxic to a healthy relationship, right? A healthy relationship has to have some sort of trust. And again, whatever that trust looks like, but there has to be something there. Because if the person says, where are you going? What are you doing? Who, who, who are you texting right now? Uh, well, what's, uh, and all of a sudden it's like in, that insecurity kind of, it, it, it begins to kind of clamp in on the relationship. It's like, okay, I can't breathe here because this person is just like always, you know, in my business, right? And so it's like, okay, so what does that look like? Well, the Bible tells us that God is jealous. And so we see this just a couple of verses later in verse, uh, uh, verse five, it says this, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Now, what we have to understand about this idea, this concept of jealous God, and by the way, it pops up all over the Old Testament. This is why people have really kind of have been very, uh, I would say, repulsed by this idea of God, right? Because when we think of God, we think of God as um, maybe your, your, your idea of God is his, he's angry. He's always angry, right? So maybe the jealousy part is like, oh, okay, well, I, I think of God as being angry, so the jealousy just feels like, you know, like, like not that far of a leap. But if some of you may be like, well, I thought God was love. And if God is love, how can God be jealous? So one of the things we have to understand about God's jealousy is the actual translation of what it actually means. So um, the root, the, uh, let me just read this, right? The root idea of the Old Testament word jealous is to become intensely red. Now, intensely red just means like, like, like in, 
if you were paler of skin color, uh, you'd be like, ah, you get, you get red and you, you, you get kind of, it's kind of a, it's, it's more about passion than it is anything else. It seems to refer to the changing color of the face or the rising heat of the emotions which are associated with the intense zeal or fervor or something dear to us. In fact, both the Old and New Testament words for jealousy are also translated zeal. Being jealous and being zealous are essentially the same thing in the Bible. God is zealous, uh, 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 eager about protecting what is precious to him. And I put this kind of as a tagline at the bottom. God is not apathetic about his relationship with us, even though we may be towards him. Now, let me just unpack this for a second. When God says he's jealous, what he's really saying is, I am passionate for you. I am, I am, I am completely invested in our relationship. Now, remember he said that, that jealousy that stems from insecurity is a very unhealthy thing, but jealousy or, or, or passion that comes from love, this is something you actually kind of do want, right? Like, nobody wants to be married to Spock, right? Nobody's like, yeah, I'm cool. Whatever you want to do, uh, you know? It's like, wait, wait don't, you, are you, don't you want to spend, well, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm cool, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. I don't want to be that person. It's like, okay, I want you to be a little bit of that person, maybe. Uh, I want you to miss me, maybe. I want you to, I don't know, do something kind of romantic or, or whatever. Right? You, you kind of want something to show a little bit of a pulse there. That's just what we're saying here, right? So what this idea of God's jealousy isn't about his insecurity, right? Please hear me clearly. God is not insecure. But what he is, is he is passionate about us, his creation, He's already unpacked that for the people. He said, listen, I brought you out of Egypt. I, I, I did these, these, these incredible manifestations of power that, that historically we will, you'll never see ever again. Why? To show you of my passion and my love for you. So when God says he's jealous, what he's really trying to say to us is that he is passionate towards us. And again, apathy within faith, within relationship, is the demise of the relationship. If you do not care whether the person that you love the most is around or, or, or with you or, or anything like that, that is a bit of a problem, right? Because you're meant to have that kind of wanting to be in a relationship, the conversation, all that kind of stuff. These, these are things you, you want to have. These are things a, a healthy relationship is supposed to have. So when God says he's jealous, please don't misunderstand that as an insecurity, as in, hey, you know, like, hey, you know, what, what religion are you going to now? Are you, hey, like, you know, what, what, uh, what Bible are you, are you, like, God's not insecure. Instead, he is completely invested in the life of who you are. He is passionate, and that, and that turning red of color is a sign of passion. And again, in the ancient Middle Eastern context, in the context of the book is written, but again, Forget the ancient Middle Eastern context. Sometimes we use that as a bit of a cop-out. Shakespearean, some of the best movies about, you know, like The Notebook, right? And of course, oh, right? It's like, it's about a love that transcends. It's about a love that's like, it's like, yeah. And, you know, like, it, that's what you want. That's what you want in a relationship. And what God is saying is that is what I am. And because that is what I am, I, I kind of expect that from the person some sort of reciprocity. Now, of course, we'll never match God's intensity, but he still wants that reciprocity, that idea of looking towards it. So when we talk about this idea of God's being jealous, just please understand that. Now, what is interesting with this first commandment that God gives people of Israel, just recently, uh, I just saw a government have a real hard time with it. I, I came across this article, and um, uh, maybe you'll find it interesting, because I did. Um, right now in China, uh, we talk about the Chinese underground church a lot. We talk about what's going on there, and what is going on there is phenomenal. We are, we are seeing people come to faith that are just incredible at, at different levels. But what is interesting is the Chinese government has always had a... Uh, tumultuous relationship with Christians. And just recently, and this is, like, so this is in January of 2019 here, I came across this article, and I went back and I found other references to this, where the Chinese government took exception to the first commandment. And this is what it says. Chinese government officials have ordered the removal of church displays which contain the first commandment because they believe it directly contradicts the policy of President Yi uh, Yingping. Yeah, um, if, I, if, I, if I mess that up, please forgive me. Um, but what's interesting is that the Chinese government recognized the first commandment as superseding whatever your devotion is towards this government. It goes on to say this, the government approved three-self church, 
By the way, that's a great church plant name right there. I don't know what it would look like, but anyways, okay. Now, the Three Self Church was forced to remove the first commandment after a visit from the Central Patrol Inspection Team of Luang City and Luang County United Front Work Department. So what is interesting is that the Chinese government, as they're trying to wrestle with all these Christians within their country, a supposedly atheistic country, a supposedly communist country, you have all these Christians, but the thing that they're recognizing, which I think is so important, and I actually applaud them, for actually having a problem with this. Because they're at least saying, our people are taking this seriously. Right? Western church is like, ah, oh, we don't care. We'll, we'll put the Ten Commandments here, or we won't put the Ten Commandments here. We don't care because nobody listens to them anyways. Right? This government's saying, hey, you know what? The people who adhere to Jesus and are Christian, who call themselves Christians, they're taking this stuff seriously. And I actually like the fact that the government's like, you know, no, we don't want number one to be in there anymore. You can have the other nine because they're behavioral and we like that. We don't want people killing or murdering. We don't want people stealing. And, and the thing about the goat or the, or the donkey, we don't know about. But anything, we're okay with everything else. But this first one, no, no, the Chinese government supersedes everything else. And so what happened was they went and said, okay, you can have the nine, but you can't have this one. Which tells me that the Chinese government understands what Christians have forgotten. Right, that what we focus on is what we become. And the Chinese government didn't want their Christians focusing on the fact that God supersedes everything else. And they understood this, and they're like, okay, you can have the nine, but let's remove the first one there because this is going to interfere with our, our domination of our people. So it's like, okay, yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. And I thought that was really uh, interesting. Let, there's a guy by the name of uh, Fry Robert Mateague, and we're going to talk a little bit more about him next week. But in an article he wrote, I thought it was really interesting, he says this, if my life were truly formed, informed, and transformed by the first commandment, how would it be different from how I've been living for the past year? What Robert McTeague said in this article, which I thought was so fantastic, was, is that if we actually took these Ten Commandments seriously, like not just as like, you know, patronizingly, but if we actually took these seriously, what would be different about our lives? And what was interesting especially is that he said, if you took the first commandment literally and seriously, what would be different about your lives? What would be different if you put nothing before you and God? How would your focus, how would your life be different? If God was a primary focus of your life, how would it change? Now, here's the thing, right? When we talk about focus, we're going to talk, we're going to unpack this a little bit more, but focus is all about this idea of, of being able to do something and do something without distraction. So, please forgive me, that might be the last basketball analogy I'll ever make right now, but... Um, Whenever you see a basketball player go to the free, uh, to make a free, uh, free throw, right? And if you see it, right, the, the, the player is about to make a free throw. And if the player is from the opposing team, everybody behind them is going crazy, right? They have like, they're, they're making their distractions. They're trying to, right? Because what are they trying to do? What does a player have to do? They have to do the easiest thing. They call it the charity stripe for a reason. Because all they have to do with nobody trying to block you, nobody trying to do anything, just put this ball into this hoop. Now, for the most of us, might be more difficult, but for these guys who make millions upon millions of dollars a year, this is what they get paid for. So they go to the charity stripe, they put the ball down, right, and they'll do whatever, and they're looking at this hoop, but behind them is a sea of people moving around, shaking around, having these things, like these flags, these bobbleheads, whatever. They're trying to distract the player from doing what they're supposed to do. What they're supposed to do? Put the ball through the hoop. Right? And so what the players have learned to do is almost blur their eyes so they can't see anything like that and just focus on the hoop. So what do they need to do to make a free throw? Focus on the hoop. Don't look at all the people. Don't look at all that's going on. Just focus on the hoop. And so what God is saying and what uh, uh, Robert Mantegas is saying is that our focus is what really will help us to understand what God is going to be like in our lives. So first, before we kind of un unpack how we kind of refocus our lives on God, let's just unpack the statement that God gives to the people in the verse here. Let me, let me break it down to three parts. So when God says, I am the Lord your God, the commandment begins with a relational reminder. God is our God. Not someone else's or another nation. He is ours. See, you have to remember the language of how God conveys his truth is always relational. This is why religion and relationship and irreligious and all this other kind of stuff out there right now, it's garbage. Because it's never meant to be separated because what you believe, how you, how you think of it, it, it will change your behavior. So when God says, here's the first commandment, he reminds them, before you get to any other parts, please hear me very clearly. I love you. I created you. Therefore, 
please remember, what I'm about to tell you, what I'm about to say to you is, is a reminder of our relational connection, of their relational integrity. Who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery? A reminder of his commitment to our relationship. He isn't passive, nor does he idly sit by and stay uninterested in our lives, our plight. Like when God says, hey, by the way, Egypt and slavery, remember that two months ago? Where were you two months ago? You were in slavery. You were, you were, you were being used by another nation to, to build their nation. And how was your army? Oh, you didn't have an army. H- how was your leader? Oh, you didn't have a leader. What did I do? I sent you a leader, and then I sent my power to free you. How much more of a commitment can I tell you, can I show you uh, that I am in you? Right? So when God says, okay, here's the first commandment. What does he say? I'm showing you my commitment to you. I'm showing how much I care for you. Um, who, uh, you must not have any other God before me. Right? So once God's relational connection has been established, once God's strength and commitment has been established, then he asks for the same focus and attention from us. And each of the commandments is a positive and a negative. The implication is that God can be replaced by what we choose to focus on. So what is God saying? You must not have any other God before me. What is the implication? You can have other gods before God. You can substitute God with something else. And this should both terrify and all of a sudden give you the aha moment. Because in our lives, God has been supplanted, replaced by things in our lives. And this is why I said we don't think enough about what we think about. Because what we think about is actually what we care about. What we choose to use our resources towards. You know, again, I I try to be as delicate as possible with this one, but this one may not be as delicate as I'm trying to make it out be. But if you were to show me a monthly bank account statement, I'll know exactly what you think is important. I'm, I'm absolutely horribly sorry about that. But what we choose to spend our money on tells us what we think is valuable. That's just, that's just the way it goes. Why? Because this is our resources. And so if I see your bank account and I see that you, you know, every weekend you go out, you spend X amount of dollars on eating out, you spend X amount of dollars on alcohol, you spend this much money on your hobby or... Uh, vic- Again, please hear me very clearly. I'm not trying to make anybody feel uh, anything other than honest, right? And the honesty is what you spend your money on tells me what is valuable to you. And so what is interesting about this is that what God is saying is your focus is really important. There's a guy named Gene S. Whitehead, and I kind of like, he has a blog out, and I kind of like some of the stuff he has. Some of the stuff I don't like as much, but, you know, that's okay, right? But one of the things he has, it has this idea of saying five steps for staying focused on God. And so he gives you five ways of staying focused on God. I'm going to give you my ways, but I think I want to start off with his, because I think his are actually kind of interesting. So the first way he says to start off with a focus on God is begin the day with God. And I think, actually, that's actually a really good point. How do you say focus on God? Start the day with God. And you know what the funny thing is? This is not rocket science. This has been part and parcel to Christian disciplines throughout, throughout, his, historically throughout the centuries. And we've absolutely forgotten it. Because what happens? Our alarm goes off, we hit snooze. And, and, and if we don't hit snooze, we've got to get up, we've got to catch a bus, we've got to get to school, we've got to get to work. We've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go. Right? Um, we, um, our family has had a, 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 a new family member added. No, Sarah's not pregnant, dear goodness. Uh, but we have a dog. We just got a dog last night. And this three-pound little mongrel is going to dictate the pace of our lives now for the next couple of months. At 3 o'clock this morning, I was up, uh, cleaned the dog's crate out because he had a boo-boo or he pooped himself. And uh, so I took him outside, and I'm outside at 3 o'clock in the morning with this dog on his leash, and he's looking up at me, and all I want to say to him is, just please just do something, because I'm really tired right now, and I just, I just really want you to just to kind of do your business and all that, right? For the next couple months, we're going to be obsessed with this dog's bowel movements. That's, that's just all there is to it, right? Because we want to get this dog trained. But the point is, is that I actually, this morning, when I set my alarm, I actually gave myself another extra uh, half hour beforehand because I knew that I had to take the dog for a walk. This dog has now changed my schedule because he threatens me with, you know, 
turning my, my house into uh, a litter box, per se, as, a, as it were, right? So I said, okay, I have to get up at X amount of time, so I only gave myself a half hour. So to get up, to take the dog for a walk, and basically, by walk, I mean drag this thing behind me as I'm trying to make it walk, right? But the point is, I have to start my day off now thinking about how to make sure that this dog gets what it needs. Why? Because, you know, you know, the dog didn't get asked to be you know, adopted by our family, although he's lucky because he's got four women in our household who just is going to just sacrifice whatever they have to for this little puppy, whatever, right, it would be. But the, the, starting my day off is this idea of, like, every morning I start off with, uh, and, and uh, as much as I am able to, because I'm human, I don't want to betray myself to be anything other than that, but I try as much as possible to pray in the morning. And for the most part, I'm pretty successful. And I've mentioned this before with my previous dog, but when you have, in the morning this morning, when I'm staying outside with the dog at, at 6.30 in the morning, Staring up at me, I'm staring down at him, trying to convey, or her, sorry, conveying to her, uh, please just, you know, go. As it's sitting there, as it's walking around sniffing, I had some time to pray. Why? Because I got nothing else to do. I'm just sitting the dog on his leash here, right? So I start my day off with God. And guess what I'm praying for? I'm praying for you. Not you specifically. Don't get paranoid or, or, or don't get uh, too proud. I just pray for this church. I pray for what happens this morning, right? So I can pray. And I'm praying, Lord, that this morning in the teaching and the worship, that People would experience that. Remain in prayer. What I love what he says here is actually kind of important. And this is like this idea of saying, you know what? Don't just pray in the morning, but just throughout the day, just be reminded to pray. Um, limit the distractions, right? Um, Netflix is, uh, I'm, I'm going through the office right now, uh, probably for the 15th time. Um, I, I, I like the office. I think it's funny. And, and I just realized, ah, I spend a lot of time, you know, maybe on Netflix. Maybe I, I don't need to spend as much time on Netflix. Maybe I don't need to spend as much time on social media or looking up at whether, uh, you know, the trades that are going on in basketball right now. Maybe I, I can spend some other time not being so distracted. Um, serve God. You know, what's interesting is that when you serve people, when you're serving God in, in whatever capacity throughout the day, it kind of reminds you what you're doing. And finally, remove sin from your life. And I think that's actually kind of important. Now, let me tell you how I would change my focus. There's three things I think that are important, and they're not practical steps. They're more abstractions and what I think you should do. The first thing is a focus on God must be immovable, and here's what I mean by that. Focus, like anything, is prone to distraction. So many things in our lives are competing for our attention, and distractions aren't as benign as we think. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There's nothing wrong with watching The Office or Netflix. There's nothing wrong with, with you know, social media or reading, you know, hockey, baseball, basketball, or entertainment, or blog. Well, it, there's nothing wrong with that. But as one person has said, the enemy of the best is the good. Right? And the thing is that without, whatever you want your faith to be, however you want your focus on God to be, whatever you need from God, you have to first give to God. And if you want God's attention, you must give God your attention. If you want to hear from God, you got to listen to God. Right? There's this reciprocity in our relationship with God that we think too little about. And so whatever we want to do, however you want to understand your relationship with God, you must create a space for God, and it must be immovable. Because I will tell you right now, everything wants to move it. Right? If you say, I want to pray in the morning, there's going to be a 30-reason excuse why you can't pray in the morning. If you want to read your Bible at night, you want to have a devotional, there's going to be 50 reasons why you shouldn't. Unless you create an immovable um, moment of kind of focusing on God, something will move it. It's the thing that we don't understand the most, but unless we create these hard disciplines in our lives for God, something will distract us, something will move it. Why? Because God is abstract. We don't see him. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't get a text from him. We don't, you know, all these things. So it's easy to say, well, you know what, God, I'm tired this morning, or it's a really sunny weather, or it's nice weather, or, you know. And, and where we've seen this most in church, and we talked a little about this a few weeks back, is Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings has become this negotiable thing with God. Now, as a pastor... I know people say, well, as a pastor, you're supposed to say these things. Sunday morning's important. I say these things not because I'm supposed to. I say these things because they are freaking true, right? Sunday morning is meant to be this community gathering, this time together of worship and, and interaction, community, how are you doing, all this type of stuff. It's meant to happen on, on this time this, this morning. And as you negotiate it, it's like, well, it's really nice out. I can't, I don't know if I can Oh, it's like, you know, Saturday night was out really late. I said to one person, Sunday morning is a Saturday night decision. Just tweet that, okay? Because that's, that's, that's good stuff, okay? 
Sunday morning is a Saturday night decision. And what I mean by that is simply this. Whatever you do Saturday night, however late you are, however you know, tired you are, Sunday morning is coming and it's tiring. And you could say, well, hey, why don't you do two at two in the afternoon or four in the afternoon? I, have, I can sleep in. I, can I, I get it. There's no perfect time. Right? We've tried different church times. There's no perfect time. We just pick one and hopefully somebody will show up. Right? But the thing is, though, is if unless you have a discipline, unless you create space for God that is immovable, it will be moved. And I have found this in my own life. Uh, I, I have realized this, that so much, even as a pastor, that um, I have, I've set my week up, because of course I have another job. I, I deliver milk on Wednesdays and Fridays. So what do I do? As I, I, I take my prayer times and I say, okay, Wednesdays and Fridays, and my staff know this, I'll send them a, a text at the beginning of the morning saying, hey, day of prayer, what can I pray for you for? What can I, what can I pray for? Because I, you know, Wednesday when you're driving a milk truck, there's nothing else I do. I can't eat, rant, answer emails. That's dangerous. Uh, I can't answer text, also dangerous. So what do I do? I pray, right? I, I just pray, right? So I try to integrate my disciplines into that day. But I also pray other than that, just so you know, right? As I've mentioned to you before, on my, um, on my smartphone, in my calendar, uh, I'm not answering text here, I'm getting my calendar out. Uh, on, on my calendar, of course you can't see this, but at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, there's a reminder, it says pray. At two o'clock in the afternoon, every day in my calendar, it says pray. Now, the good news is, for the most part, I know it's coming, so I'm, all, I'm already praying. But e- the even better news is if I'm distracted or if I'm, out, if I'm doing something, this reminder says, pops up and pray. I have made prayer immovable in my life by reminding myself to do so. And it also helps to be a church planner because <laughs> you just got to pray because I don't know what's going to happen, right? So this idea of saying, you know, whatever your discipline is, at, whatever your focus on God, if it's not immovable, it will be moved, and just like any other things in your life that you want to do that are good for you, like diets or exercise, if these things become movable, they will be moved. Pleasure, laziness, uh, distractions, they move these things. So unless your focus on God is immovable. I love what it says in the parable of the sower, right? The third seed. We are the people of the third seed, right? We are the people of the third seed. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and so they never grow into maturity. Western Christianity has a lot of baby Christians packing their churches, but not a lot of mature Christians. Why? It's, it's crowded out. We have a crowded life. You get up, you look at your phone, you look at this, you get up. Like, we are just distracted. And just so you know, God wants our focus. The commandment that was given to these people thousands of years ago could have been given yesterday, right? Why? Because we are distracted. So a focus on God must be immovable. A focus on God must be measurable. Now, here's what I mean by this. We have to be able to track our focus throughout the day in order to know whether we have succeeded in our intent. The reasons religions, (coughs) excuse me, have external disciplines, reminders, is because we need to make space for God. You know, in the Jewish culture, they had five times of prayer. If you're a Muslim, you have five times of prayer. If you are, um, in, in, uh, if you're a Buddhist, if you are, these religions, and of course, historically Christianity as well too, they had external ways of creating space. Um, for those who may come from a Catholic background, I, I have a great deal of respect for Catholicism. But what I really love about Catholicism is they have a lot of physical ways of reminding themselves about their thing, about their, about their spiritual lives. And one of the ones I like the most, I don't, I've never done, but it's this idea of prayer beads. Now, if you ever met somebody from a uh, Catholic background, they have these beads, and uh, what they do is they'll pray through the beads, and, and they'll just put them through your hands. And, and each bead represents a prayer. And I love that idea just because it's a physical, tactile way to remind yourself to pray. Okay, right? What, what do they do? They create external ways of quantifying your focus on God. Now, what does that mean for you? I don't know. But for me, it has a digital reminder on my phone to pop up to pray. It has the, uh, there's other disciplines I have in my life, whether it's fasting or meditation or reflection. I try to create that in my week. And, and just so you know, um, and for those of you who ever tried to make an appointment with me, <laughs> my weeks are busy. I, have, I, have, I don't have as much time as I would like to have because of uh, delivering milk and plus sermon prep and all that stuff. But I have to make sure that I have to be able to look back on my day and say, okay, did I actually focus in on God? You know, one of the best ways of focusing on God is prayer journals. No, hardly anybody does it anymore. But like, if you want, I'll go to the dollar store. Or I'll even go to, I'll, I'll find you a nicer one. But prayer journals are fantastic. Whether beginning of the day or the end of the day, just to write your prayer for the God and just put a date on it so you can actually track 
what you experienced that day, just looking back, it's fantastic. What? It's an external way of focusing in it. Because you can look back and say, oh, yeah, I did, I, I did my journal entry. I did my devotion. There are so many great apps, and we talked about this um, a few months back. We talked about our spiritual discipline series. But there's so many Bible apps you can have on your smartphone right now that will give you a devotion for the day, depending on your time, right? Like, is it your five-minute devotion, 10-minute devotion? And it will pop up on your phone, and you get to go, oh, I get to read that. Whether you're commuting to school or have a break at work, right? But what happens? If it is measurable, you can actually go back and go, oh, okay, great, I get it. Now, Colossians and 1 Peter, this idea of this idea of growth, but I like what Colossians says, right? So Paul, right into the church in Colossae, don't drift away. You ever gone boating? And you just kind of lie down like in a rowboat or a canoe or, or something. What you don't realize is even though you're not doing anything, you're stationary, there's something underneath you that's moving you. Right, and, and, and that's what drifting looks like, right? Not like car drifting, I'm, you know, like not like Fast and Furious drifting. That's just weird. Um, but I mean like, like boat drifting, right? You just start drifting away. So you could be by a boat, by the shore, you can see the shore, put your head down from the middle of now, wake up and be in the middle of nowhere. You have been moved by something unseen. Well, that's focus. If you do not make it measurable, if you do not look back and say, oh yeah, I actually did something today, you will drift. You will drift. Right? And so that's what Paul's saying to Colossae. Don't drift away. Don't lose focus on God for a moment. Because if you do so, that becomes so much easier the next day or the next moment. And finally, um, it must be measurable. Right? We, um, immovable, measurable. Did I already do this one? Yeah, I did. Okay, sorry. It, it must be manageable. Now, here's what I mean by manageable. Back when I was uh, younger, I remember hearing a, a sermon from somebody about uh, reading my Bible. And when I was younger, I was, like, when I was a teenager, I was not good at that. Um, I get distracted easily. My wife says I have ADHD. I do not. But I, I might be a little more hyper than probably was, you know, normal. And back then, you know, no one, no one cared about the mental health of kids and all that. They were just, they were meant to be, you know, uh, not seen and maybe not heard as well too, right? So I was very easily distracted. So I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to read my Bible for an hour a day. I made this pronouncement. And it was a great pronouncement. And of course, hey, you want to read your Bible for an hour a day? You know, have at it. But then I ripped open, uh, opened the Bible. And then I was like, uh, and after 10 minutes, I, like, I, I can't remember what I read. So you have to go back, right? And like, okay, okay. Uh, what, what, what? Who, who, Herschel, who, what? Okay, I'll go back. Okay, what, what? Where, where does this go? Come? Uh, it did not work out well for me. Now, the way to mean by manageable is whatever decision you make for the focus on God, please make sure you don't make too lofty of decisions. Like, like, don't decide, I'm going to fast for 40 days. Or I'm going to do, like, just make it manageable. And if you want to have a conversation with me or somebody else in this, in this church who could maybe sit down with you about saying, hey, let's, let's, let's work this out to you, please do so. Because whether you're a student, whether you work full-time, whether it's a mixer or both, whatever your life context is, you can create space for God, but you just got to make sure you do it with wisdom. Just do it with wisdom. I don't know what I have on the screen there. It's, it's, it's good stuff, whatever it is. But I just simply mean just be wise about it, but be intentional about it too. So if you're a student and you see your schedule for the week and you say, wait, you're not first day in the morning, I'm not, I'm not awake until, you know, whatever. Just, just do that. Is it lunchtime for you? Is it the end of the evening for you? But I'll tell you one time you don't want to spend time with God is right before bed. Do not do that. Because I'm telling you right now, prayer and sleep are too close together. Uh, I just, I'm just going to let you know that right now, okay? So if you decide, put your head down, it's like, okay, I'm going to pray now. Dear Lord, right? That's it. It's over. So what, whatever your spiritual discipline is, do not integrate your bed into it because it will not happen, okay? Just, just that's, what that, that's for free. Not that you're paying for anything else, but you get the idea, right? So, so however you want to keep your focus, it, it must be immovable, it must be uh, measurable, and it must be manageable. Let me close. There's a passage of scripture, there's a chapter in the Bible that's not controversial, but it's kind of, it, 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 it gives you all the feels because it's so visceral, right? So the book of Romans is a very thick and heady book. Romans chapter one, when Paul starts off this huge letter to the church in Rome, which is being persecuted, being killed off by Nero at that time, the emperor Nero, and, and, and hundreds of thousands of Christians, without exaggeration, are being killed by the Romans. And so Paul writes this letter to Rome to encourage them. 
But if you're writing a letter to the church, to, to somebody who's being uh, persecuted, you usually want to start off with, hey, I know it sucks right now, but God is there, right? Paul, Paul is Paul, and he doesn't do that. Is that in Romans chapter 1, he sets off by saying, okay, just so you know, before we get to the good stuff, before we talk about God's love, what can separate you from God's love? Romans chapter 8, you know, uh, uh, never be lacking in zeal. Romans, like, before you get to all that stuff, let's first clarify your relationship with God. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, hey, just so you know, here's what you need to make sure you're, you're being very aware of. And Romans chapter 1 can almost be kind of summed up in this one verse here. Paul is telling the people in Rome, listen, Make sure that you are focusing in on God. Forget all these behaviors. Forget all these things that you can do. And it's verbal. It's, it's what you do. It's, it's what you do with other people. It's all these things. And you can get caught up on that. But what Paul says in verse 25 is this. What the people did, the greatest sin that the people did, is they exchanged God for a lie. See, that's what we do today. We exchange what is eternal, what is profound, what is, what is meant to be something that is transcendent, and we exchange it for Netflix. We exchange it for this. We exchange it for that. And Paul says that unless you stop exchanging God for other things in your life, you will never grow in your life with God. And it is so easy to do so. Please hear me very clearly. I've got three kids. I've got a wife, and I've got a puppy now and it is so easy to get distracted in your lives i get it i don't want to stand up here and saying you must do this for god that's just that's just setting up for failure right we have to be authentic and honest about our focus but we have to realize that unless we are focused in on god we will we will find distractions upon distractions you shall have no other god before me is god saying to us don't be distracted in your lives from me. Because whatever happens in your life, school, relationships, friendships, finances, work, whatever it would be, these things are temporary. And even if you work for X amount of years, even if you have a relationship for X amount of years, when you take your last breath, I will be waiting for you on the other side of life. There's a curtain that's going to be pulled aside. And every decision you made in that life before that, every decision, every moment that you made in life before that will come to fruition, a culmination in that moment. And that curtain will be pulled aside and God will be waiting for us on the other side of that. And our focus is what we want to have before that. That's it. I don't mean to be dramatic. I don't mean to be overly exaggerating. I just mean to be honest with you. Our focus on God right now is what is going to help us in our life now and in the future. You shall have no other God before me. You should love me and me alone because I am worth it. Not me, but God. You get the idea. Let's pray. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up. And we do worship. Uh, we bookend the teaching with worship on either side because we want you to have moments to reflect, to think. Um, we realize that in the teaching, in my teaching, that um, there's a lot of information. And so, obviously, it's a time to reflect, to think about it. But... The question I want you to reflect on in our worship time, the thing I want you to think about the most is, how have you been distracted from your relationship with God? Is it a person? Is it a relationship? Is it an addiction? Is it life? Is it school? Is, is it work? What, what is distracting you from God? And remember, distractions aren't bad. They're not evil. But they're not benign either. They're, they're not zero sum. They mean something. And God says to us, you shall have no other God before me. You shall have nothing before me. Only I am worth your full attention. And your days are filled with things that have to get done. Your days are filled with things you need to do. But God says, you know what? I'm worth it. I'm worth it. And so our time of reflection, our time of our worship, that's the question I want you to ask yourself. And maybe this morning, maybe just, oh, if you're just that brave enough, you can put something immovable in your schedule. Thank God, you know what? I have not prayed consistently with you. I pray when I remember it. I pray before I'm about to eat. But I don't really pray. Maybe that's the thing you want to add. Maybe it's, it's serving. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe you look at your resources and say, you know what, Lord? I keep everything for myself. Whatever it is, like, God, I want to put something immovable in my life so that I can keep my focus in on you.
God's not jealous. He's passionate. He is passionate for you. He's passionate for your life and your decisions, not just now, but the future. He just wants us to be passionate for him as well. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we serve a God who is passionate, who is not apathetic, who is not um, distant from us, but instead he is involved, he is with us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that in this time of, of worship and of reflection, that we would feel that, we would sense that, we would hear that from you. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Even though we forget, pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us and just help us to focus on you in Jesus' name. Amen.